change Britain, we must change ourselves. We need to clean up politics. No more VIP fast lanes. No more kickbacks for colleagues. No more revolving doors between government and the companies they regulate. I will restore standards in public life with a total crackdown on cronyism. This is my video update on this Thursday afternoon, September the 19th. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with a second wave of electronic device explosions. Yesterday we had uh, walkie-talkies exploding in Lebanon that were in the possession of Hezbollah, allegedly in the possession of, uh, of Hezbollah. And this followed the first wave of explosions, which was 3,000 uh, pagers exploding, which allegedly Hezbollah had, had purchased these pagers in order to prevent uh, Israel from spying on their mobile phone communication. So they purchased pagers, and we talked about this in my video update yesterday, the pagers exploded, and that was the first wave of, of device explosions. And yesterday we had the second wave. There are some reports saying that the tablets and mobile phones also exploded yesterday, but I, I can't confirm that. What I do know, at least reading from, uh, from the various reports, specifically from Collective West Mainstream Media, is that definitely walkie-talkies were targeted in the second uh, wave of explosions in Lebanon. Now, there are two, two schools of thought as to what is going on here. Why are we seeing uh, these explosions? And by the way, the New York Times, they ran an article saying that, that this was uh, Israeli intelligence behind the, uh, the detonation of these, of these pagers and these devices. So even the New York Times is saying that this was most likely uh, produced by Israeli intel to target Hezbollah. But uh, why? Why now? Why are we seeing this action happen now at this specific time? There are two thoughts, two schools of thought here. The first, uh, the first uh, school of thought is that initially the detonation of these devices was going to happen once Israel was about to start a war with, uh, with Hezbollah. They were going to, to start things off with with uh, the detonation of these mobile devices. They would cut off Hezbollah's uh, communication, at least for a couple of days. And uh, Hezbollah uh, leaders would, uh, would suffer injuries or be maimed or maybe even killed by the detonation of, uh, of these pagers. Because most likely you have these pagers in your pocket or, or on your side and once, once they explode, they bust apart a hip or, or something. And, uh, and this was going to, to cause all kinds of trouble for Hezbollah. And then a war was going to start um, right away. Some sort of attack would happen right after the detonation. But some reports are saying that Hezbollah got wind of what was going on. And so this, this forced Israel to, to just detonate the, the devices uh, a couple of days ago and yesterday. So that's why it happened at this time, because Hezbollah caught wind of, of, of what was happening. And so Israel decided to pull the trigger on the, the operation, send whatever message they sent or whatever trigger they had, and, and they detonated these devices. That's the first uh, school of thought. The second school of thought is more simple, and I think is the more correct uh, analysis as to why now. It is that, uh, that Netanyahu is desperately trying to provoke a conflict with Hezbollah and ultimately with Iran. And, and he's getting frustrated. He's getting frustrated at the fact that, uh, that Hezbollah and Iran, specifically Iran, they have not retaliated for the Israeli strikes into, into Syria, into the embassy in Syria, and the strike into Tehran where they got the Hamas uh, official. And so Netanyahu is getting frustrated. He wants to get a conflict going. Uh, he wants to get a conflict going before the US elections. He wants to get a conflict going before uh, winter sets in. Uh, Alexander, me and Alexander did a video on the Duran and Alexander pointed out that 
that given the terrain of Iran, once winter starts to set in, it's going to make things a bit more difficult for, for any kind of, uh, of conflict in, in the region. Anyway, that's, that's another uh, school of thought there as to why this, this happened now. It's, it's really more about uh, the timing and, uh, and the fact that time is running out to, to try and get some sort of conflict going with Iran. And uh, Netanyahu is getting frustrated, so he's trying to, to provoke Hezbollah, and that will ultimately provoke Iran. So uh, that's, that's some of the analysis as to what may be going on here. And, and I talked about how the New York Times says that, that this was uh, Israeli intel that manufactured these, these devices. The reports are, the thinking is that that these devices were, were, were actually being manufactured by uh, Israeli intelligence. I mean, they were actually building pagers. I, I can't confirm any of this, but uh, the, the Taiwanese company, they entered into a licensing agreement with this company in Europe, in Hungary, called BAC, but this company, BAC, was one employee from what the reports are, are indicating. It was one employee, uh, a revenue of, of 655 million dollars. Over here, I'm, say, I'm seeing 665 million dollars. I don't know if that's correct, that reporting. Maybe 665 thousand dollars. But uh, this, was, this was one employee, this BAC company, and it was basically a shell company in Hungary. And behind the shell company, the reports are saying it was, it was Israel behind this shell company. And they were, actually, they were actually making pagers, like pagers without explosives, for many years. And eventually, they got the order from Hezbollah. And that's when they produced the 5,000 pagers, a total of 5,000 pagers, with an explosive device. And they shipped those pagers to Hezbollah, and the 3,000 uh, detonated successfully when they were triggered. So this has been a long uh, process. This operation has been a long time in the making. And eventually, they, they actually got an order from Hezbollah for these devices. The Mail Online says, Israel did not tamper with Hezbollah pagers. They built them from scratch using shell companies that had been making and shipping the devices to Lebanon for years in preparation for attack. The company was registered in Hungary in 2022. I'm curious about this revenue figure that I read out. Six, 665,000, my bad. My bad, everybody, 665,000. I was, I, was I was reading it wrong. So one employee, 665,000 revenue. This is what the, the Mail Online is reporting. This is what the New York Times is reporting. Israel had long been preparing a complex operation to blow up pagers in Lebanon and had previously created a front company to manufacture communication devices with explosives. So that's how this whole thing went down, at least according to Mail Online, New York Times, and other mainstream media. The company in Hungary was, was a shell company, one person, and for many years, Israel was actually, Israeli intel, whatever, was actually manufacturing real pagers that worked without explosive devices until they got the order for the, uh, for the pagers to Hezbollah, and those are the ones that they put the explosive devices in. Crazy, this, this, this whole incident reminds me a bit of uh, the blowing up of Nord Stream, doesn't it? When I said yesterday, it feels like we've, we've crossed uh, a Rubicon, we've crossed a red line. I felt the same way with Nord Stream, the blowing up of uh, critical infrastructure like pipelines. We definitely crossed a red line there. And, uh, and in this instance, 
um, creating explosives out of mobile devices. We definitely crossed, crossed some sort of red line there as well. So, uh, let's see here. Lavrov, he, he actually said that this was about provoking a larger war. So that's Lavrov's thinking on this. He came out with a statement uh, yesterday and he said that what this is about is, is, it, is effectively just provoking a war with, uh, with Hezbollah and eventually with Iran. Blinken, he denies that uh, the U.S. had anything to do with this. They had no idea what, uh, what was going on. CNN ran an article with the title, Israel notified U.S. ahead of Tuesday's Lebanon operation, but gave no details of what was planned, sources say. So the U.S. got a heads up that something big was about to happen, but they had no idea what the details were. I don't know, do you guys believe that? A denial from Blinken? Ugh, a denial from Blinken. Blinken would never lie to us, would he? Would Anthony Blinken ever lie? I don't know. Just don't know if Blinken would, would issue a, a, a false denial. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that. So a lot of people yesterday were, were cheering this on. A lot of people on Twitter. And uh, mostly Twitter, actually. And the, and the collective West uh, mainstream media, they were cheering this on as, uh, as a very clever uh, idea from Israel, uh, from Israeli intelligence, not thinking about the, the repercussions, the blowback, uh, what this could mean in the future. They just thought of this as, as a clever idea to target Hezbollah, uh, not thinking that, that these pagers could have gotten into the hands of, of civilians, uh, nurses, doctors, children. Uh, could have ended up in crowded areas, markets, supermarkets, maybe even on transportation, buses, maybe even a plane. They didn't think about that. They were just thinking, wow, this is such a, such a clever idea. And, and a lot of people, very prominent people, were, were actually s celebrating this. For example, uh, Twitter CEO, ex-CEO, ex uh, Linda... Yacorino, she replied to a New York Post a cover with the title Beep, Beep, Boom. And then she replied to it with, with an explosion uh, emoji. So that doesn't look too good. We have some people now um, saying, you know, maybe this isn't such a such a good thing after all. Maybe this wasn't such a, such a clever thing that, uh, that happened with the, with, the, with the exploding of these pagers. And, and we're getting articles with titles like this, an ingenious strike but how long until Putin starts blowing up his foes? An ingenious strike, but how long before Putin starts blowing up his foes? What, what publication is this from? Doesn't say. Lord Bebo posted this saying, the, fascinate, the fascinating part about the West is the ability to turn own actions around and make the others the bad guys. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm not sure from what publication this is from. But, um, okay, Russia, they turn it around to, to focus on Russia because you always have to somehow, some way connect Russia to, to this madness, right? To this terrible thing that happened. Somehow you have to, you know, move, you have, you have, to, you have to weave Russia into, into the narrative. Expect it, okay, whatever. But uh, th this is an admission, getting past the... The, the Russophobia and the, the obsession with, with Russia and Putin, getting past all of, all of that stupidity. This is an admission from uh, this publication and from this author that, uh, oh crap, 
oh crap, this could be used against us. This type of, of blast could be used to, to come back at us. That's, that's what this person is saying. And he hides it under the, the whole Putin thing, right? I, I read some other, some other uh, posts on X saying uh, what, what happens when China starts weaponizing their, their devices against us. And people were, were posting stuff like that, which, which I find to be uh, idiotic. Once again, an admission that what has happened is, is dangerous and reckless and we've crossed uh, a red line, a Pandora's box has been opened. It is that, that admission. But, but it's also crazy to, to start talking about Russia and China because Russia and China would never do such a thing. Just like Russia would never blow up infrastructure like Nord Stream, Russia would never do such a thing and China would never do such a thing because China understands if such a thing were to ever, ever, ever happen, the, the made in China would, would just would just be at, at a, a huge risk buying something that's made in China. Just like now, made in Israel, people are going to think twice about, about purchasing stuff, high-tech stuff, which, which has been uh, manufactured or designed or created or software from, from Israel. I mean, this is going to do a lot of medium and long-term damage to, to the tech industry in, in Israel, I think. Maybe I'm wrong. But the China would never do this, just like Russia would never blow up uh, a pipeline, right? Let's move on and talk about Alensky in New York. Alensky is going to New York. He is going to speak at the United Nations, the General Assembly. I believe he's going to be speaking at the Security uh, Council. He's going to give a speech to the Security Council. This is a big, this is a big show for Olensky. This is this is showtime, right, for Olensky. This may be his biggest performance to date. This could be a make-or-break performance for the clown actor. He better wear his best uh, green T-shirt for this event because he's going to ask for for money, of course, for weapons, but but most importantly for Olensky, he is going to ask for the U.S.'s permission to launch uh, storm shadows and attack bombs into Russian territory. Not that Ukraine is going to launch those storm shadows and attack bombs. The Collective West is going to, to do most of the, the work in launching the missiles into Russia, but he wants to get the U.S.'s his approval on all of this. And, uh, and that's his last throw. This is Zelensky's last last chance to to keep this conflict uh going he's he's betting everything on the long range missile strikes into russia because that that for him is is his last chance to try and provoke a response from russia which would then lead to nato the united states getting directly involved in the conflict in Ukraine. So he's going to be going to the United States, to the UN, and the reports are that Zelensky is also going to pitch his, uh, his victory plan, not only to the Biden White House, but he is going to pitch his victory plan to Kamala Harris and to Trump. He is going to meet personally with Kamala Harris, Zelensky curse number one, and he is going to meet personally with Donald Trump, Alensky curse number two. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it looks like world leaders are still not watching this, this show, this channel, because they, they are still not taking the Alensky curse seriously. And uh, Donald Trump should take the Alensky curse seriously. This is a bad idea. Do not meet with Alensky. Do not, at least do not meet with him face to face, talk to him on the phone, send one of your representatives to meet with him. Do not meet with Alensky face to face, do not shake his hand, absolutely do not hug him. 
if you are planning to meet with Olensky in New York, speak with Orban, see what Orban did to prevent the Olensky curse from hitting Orban. Maybe fly to, to Russia and, and shake Putin's hand so that that can act as, as a way to, to prevent the Olensky curse, right? Because when you meet with Putin, it looks like meeting with Putin uh, nullifies the effects of the Olensky curse. I don't know, but uh, these are the reports that we are getting. He is going to be meeting with, uh, with Kamala and with Trump and with the Biden White House, and he is going to present his, his victory plan to all of these, uh, these people. And we know what his victory plan is. There's nothing specific in his victory plan. There are no real de details in his victory plan. Actually, we've gotten reports that he's still ironing out his victory plan. Even to this day, they're still trying to put the finishing touches on their victory plan. Weapons, it's, it's weapons, money, permission for long-range missile strikes, and uh, a second uh, peace summit once Putin has capitulated from uh, the chaos that they're hoping to inflict inside of Russia with these long-range missile strikes. That's, that's his victory plan. That's it. Nothing more to it. So uh, that's, that's Zelensky going to New York. He was going to meet with leaders of, uh, of South America, South American countries. He was setting up a meeting with them in New York as well. And... According to media in Brazil, uh, Alensky canceled that meeting. You know why he canceled that meeting? Because uh, no countries from South America were going to show up. And they felt that this would be very embarrassing for Alensky to, to attend a meeting and, and no one shows up. <laughs> hey, Podoliak, where are all the people? Podoliak, I thought we had a meeting. What is going on? No one show up to meet me. Why not? Yeah, so he canceled it. Canceled the whole thing. No one wants to meet with Olensky, at least no one in the, in the global south who wants to meet with Olensky. I, I wonder if Harris is going to meet with Olensky. <laughs> I wonder if Trump is going to meet with Olensky. Do you think they're going to meet with Olensky? I don't know. I don't know. I have a feeling that at least uh, that the Harris campaign, the Trump campaign as well, but I have a feeling that the Harris campaign is, has also told Kamala Harris to stay away from Project Ukraine. It's, it's a losing topic. Stay away from it. Stay away. So uh, that's, that's the story there. Uh, CNN is reporting that, that the Pentagon, they are telling Ukraine that uh, there are no more weapons. They're tapped out. And CNN is pointing out the fact that, that the recent... Uh, arms deliveries to Ukraine have been under $400 million of the, the last three, three arms deliveries that the U.S. military has sent to Ukraine have been in the 150 to uh, $250 million range, where in the past, six months ago or, or a year ago, Ukraine was, uh, was getting consistent arms deliveries of $400 million, $500 million, $1 billion, $2 billion, uh, dollars and now the U.S. is is barely scraping together 200 million in uh, arms shipments to send to Ukraine, and the Pentagon is saying enough. The Pentagon is saying enough. Our inventories are low. We've been, as the United States of America, we've been effectively demilitarized. We've got a whole bunch of contracts with the MIC, huge, multi multi billion dollar con contracts with the uh, MIC. But, you know, they're going to need a couple of years to, to create all these weapons. And most of the weapons that they're going to create are going to, to be used to restock uh, U.S. inventories. And then whatever other weapons the MIC is going to, be, is going to create, they're going to go to fulfill uh, contracts with, with other countries. And uh, there's just nothing more to give to Project Ukraine. The U.S. is, is tapping out, man. And this follows reports, specifically from The Hill, which uh, claims that whoever wins in 2024, whether it's Harris or Trump, there's no more money to give to Alensky. So no more weapons, no more money. And the American people are fed up with uh, Project Ukraine. So what does Alensky have to do? He has to get the U.S. into the war. He has to provoke something very big which is why I feel if he gets the, the long-range missile strikes, 
which I think is 50-50 now. But if he gets the, the green light for the missile strikes, Ukraine's gonna, gonna try to create something really big, some big chaos. They're gonna, they're gonna go after a big target and it's not gonna be a military target. I, I, my, my mind keeps on coming back to trying to, to hit some sort of nuclear facility or infrastructure in order to provoke a huge response from, uh, from Moscow. Anyway, that is the news there. And, uh, oh, and Mexico's new president, she is uh, rejecting an invitation to meet with Alensky. Alensky invited her for, uh, for a meeting to Kiev and, and she said no. She said no. <laughs> Claudia Schanbaum, the new president, rejected Alensky's invitation to visit Ukraine. Mexican foreign policy is based on non-interventionism and peaceful resolutions. That's a smart, smart woman right there. She understands the power of the Alensky curse. I wonder if she watches these videos. <laughs> I wonder if she is watching these videos from the DF, Distrito Federal capital of Mexico. She said, nope, there's going to be no hugs, no handshakes, none of that stuff. <laughs> I am not going to Kiev. So in the Kursk region, uh, Ukraine tried to, tried to break through in Kursk. They tried to make a breakthrough in one of the, the front lines in, uh, in Kursk. Gluchkovo is where they tried to break through. Uh, right before the, the trip to, to New York. Obviously, Alensky has to hold on to Kursk. As he travels to New York, he can't have Kursk get rolled back completely. They have to keep the narrative of the, the genius of the Kursk incursion while he's uh, in New York lobbying for uh, long-range missile uh, strike permission. But uh, they tried to break through in this area in Kursk. And the reports are that the Ukraine uh, military got absolutely uh, demolished. Completely demolished. Things in Kursk are going really bad for the Ukraine military. This is, this is turning into a huge major debacle. The only, the only question is, it's not whether Ukraine is going to suffer a huge massive defeat in Kursk. The big question is, is when? Is, is it all going to collapse? Is Alensky going to be able to make it through September and effectively make it through the the UN uh, meeting. It's a loud motorcycle. Or is it going to fall apart when he's in New York? And if it falls apart when he's in New York, Alensky's in big trouble, man. He is in big trouble if Kursk falls apart, which is why we're getting a uh, word that Alensky is telling his generals and Sirsky hold on to Kursk at all costs and, Pak and Pakrovsk. Don't let Pakrovsk fall. Don't let uh, Kursk crumble. At least not while I'm in New York peddling the fiction of, uh, of holding on to Pakrovsk and the great Kursk incursion. We cannot let these PR fictitious narratives come to light. Not while I'm lobbying for money weapons, my victory plan, and uh, long-range missile strikes. So that's the story there. And I think... I could get to some clown worlds, if I have any clown worlds. I feel like uh, Linda Yaccarino and her explo explosion emoji. That's, that's, in ter that's a terrible uh, reply to the New York Post, but it's kind of a clown world, I guess. But um, let's see what else. Germany's largest car manufacturer, Volkswagen, is reportedly planning to cut up to 30,000 jobs. Deindustrialization in Germany. And the Fed, they, they cut interest rates. They cut interest rates a month before the election. Nothing, nothing going on there, huh? Nothing going on to help Kamala Harris there. No, 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 no. No, the Fed is not, is not meddling just a little bit in order to help Kamala Harris. Anyway, let's do some kind of clown worlds. I don't think these are 
big time clown worlds for today, but let's give it a shot. Uh, the Kremlin, they are going to be posting videos on YouTube again, following their uh, meta Facebook ban. The Kremlin is saying that they are going to start posting at their YouTube channel, at Kremlin, which is interesting because Russia slowed down YouTube. So I wonder if, if the fact that they're going to start posting videos on the Kremlin channel on YouTube means that they're going to start rolling back the slowing down of YouTube in Russia. When asked whether the at Kremlin channel had gone back online in order to better convey Russia's point of view to Western audiences, Peskov confirmed that was the case, the Kremlin spokesman. The Kremlin has resumed posting content on its YouTube channel in order to extend its reach to foreign audiences. Spokesman Dmitry Peskov said on Thursday, the channel was reactivated earlier in September following a six month pause due to a slowdown of the video hosting service in Russia. So I guess the slowdown of YouTube is being reversed in Russia. I don't know, people in Russia that are watching this uh, channel from Russia, let everybody know if uh, the slowdown is, uh, is no more, which would be a good thing. This is a good thing. And finally, the last story. I don't know if this is a clown world. Maybe this is a clown world. Venezuela seeks, to, seeks the arrest of Argentina's Millet. Caracas has opened a criminal investigation of Argentine President Javier Millet for handing over a seized Venezuelan cargo plane to the U.S. This has to do with the cargo plane that was seized about a year ago, not the recent, not the seizure of uh, the Maduro plane that was seized, I believe, in Florida. Oh, no, where, where was the Maduro plane seized? I forgot where, where they seized that, uh, that plane. Anyway, uh, this has to do with, with the seizing of a, of a cargo plane that belonged to Venezuela about a year ago. And uh, Venezuela is now saying that the Malay government broke like around seven laws or eight uh, laws, Venezuelan laws, and he now has to be arrested. <laughs> Which is interesting because Malay, he was pushing for the ICC to issue an arrest warrant for Maduro. So now Maduro is about to issue an arrest warrant for Malay. Looks like those two guys don't like each other too much. Anyway, that is the video, everybody. TheDuran.Locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. Pick up some merch like the t-shirt I am wearing today in this video. You will find a link in the description box down below. Take care.